Okay, so I have 30 minutes to give a, an iteration of a talk that I did is one hour, and then I managed to squeeze it down to 50 minutes. So I'm just going to talk really, really fast. Um, yes, yeah, so I've got 30 minutes. I want to use one of those minutes um, as, I guess, as an example of what Camille was talking about in terms of being a multiplier, which is I'm going to shut up. So we've got a room full of, I don't know, a couple of hundred uh, either lead developers or people moving into that role or people with an interest in lead development being in that role. I would like you to do this for about a minute. I want you to turn to someone either beside you or behind you, but the criteria are you don't know them. And in that one minute, you're going to find out one thing about them and they're going to find out one thing about you. And I just turned myself into a 200x multiplier. Go. <laughs> Do you see how the energy in the room has completely changed? <laughs> how about that? So, I want to talk about what it means to move beyond developer. Um, let's go back. Okay. In the beginning. So, this is 1844. This is all the software in the world. All the code in the world. Does anyone know what this is? This is one hand goes up. Go on. Nothing to do with weaving machines. <laughs> no, it's not that. Census. Sorry? Census. Nothing to do with census. Artillery. Nothing to do with artillery. Accounting. Accounting. Nearly to do with accounting. It's actually a, an algorithm describing the Bernoulli series, uh, written by a lady called Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace's dad was Lord Byron. Ada Lovelace's mum said, I don't care what you go into, not poetry. <laughs> Okay. And she said, I'm going to be the, the world's first programmer. In 1844, this is all the programmers in the world. This is, this is Ada Lovelace. This is a group shot. Um, so what we know about 1844 is that all the programmers in the world really knew how to dress. Okay. So roll forward. You wait. Time passes. Anybody recognize this? Yeah, a few people recognize this. Thorin waits. Oh. Good old Thorin. 100 years later then, 1944, Second World War, all a bit more serious. Okay, We've got programmers. Uh, these programmers are literally hacking. They're, they're trying to break the Lorentz cipher, the Enigma machine. Uh, um, according to uh, the Wikipedias, they are Dorothy de Boisson and Elsie Booker, which I think is quite nice names. I like them. And they are, So the way they're programming is they're moving wires around, because that's how you programmed in those days. So this is 1944. So you can imagine, this is an emerging thing. It's all very new and all very exciting. So we invent tools. This is the laziness part, right? This is where we start getting into laziness. This is Admiral Grace Hopper. She's a hero of mine. She invented compilers, because doing that stuff manually was getting dull, right? So I, I, I should probably go and invent compilers now. Uh, <laughs> she also invented the nanosecond, which was uh, she was trying to explain to a bunch of other admirals why it took time for communications to move around. And she's like, oh, this is ridiculous. So she phoned down to the machine room and said, I want you to cut me off lengths of wire about yay long, okay, about three feet long. And so she started carrying like, bunches of these wires around her neck. And then she'd be in a meeting and she'd say, have a nanosecond. Have a nanosecond. And because that's how far light travels in a nanosecond. Right? And she said, OK, so we're on a ship here. We want to get a message to a ship here. We have the ionosphere. So what you do is you line up all the nanoseconds to get to the ionosphere, and all the nanoseconds to get back down, and then all the nanoseconds in the circuitry. That is the shortest possible time for messages. And they went, oh, <laughs> like this. So quite good at explaining stuff. So now, right, let's roll this forward. People begin to specialize. So this is now the 1960s. So programming has become simple enough that even men can do it. <laughs> This is a <laughs> this is this is a witch mainframe. So this is now what happens, and this happens a lot. Is you go ideas go from military through academia into general uh, release. So, ARPA, the, the the DARPA, the U.S. Defense Agency, invented ARPANET, which became the Internet. Um, 
uh, was it? Uh, Tim Berners-Lee wanted to uh, share stuff, porn probably, with some guys in other colleges, and he went, oh, okay, I need to in invent the World Wide Web, and then we all ended up doing that to, using that to sell people stuff. So, okay, but we're, we're specialists, and these guys, early pair programmers, okay, or <laughs> possibly pair debugging, I suspect. Like, oh, I don't know, it shouldn't be that, what do you think? So, okay, and, but the point of this is everything up to this point was very, very specialised. You had analysts analyzing, you had uh, designers designing, programmers programming, testers testing. Okay, and then the New Testament. So uh, in 2001, a bunch of middle-aged white men gather around a, 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 a snowbird uh, um, skiing lodge. It's not, it's not my phrase, Linda Rising calls them middle-aged white men. I like that a lot. Um, 17 geeks, and they all get together and they invent this thing. They, they draft this thing, the Agile Manifesto. They say, we have been working independently doing software stuff, and now we've gotten together, and it turns out that we've got a lot more in common than we thought. So, what does that mean for you, then? That means that you are now probably working in a much more cross-functional environment. You're working in teams of people who come from very different backgrounds and do very different things. So it means you are beyond developer at this stage. So let's look at who you are. You are, you're a developer, okay? You're technical, but you're leading a team, all right? So there's that aspect to it. That team's building a product, okay? That product is on a platform somewhere, okay? It didn't just magically appear, right? And that's, you're working in a department, and that department is in an organization. So we've immediately got six different dimensions along which you are, you just suddenly became a lot more interesting, didn't you? Yeah? Wow, I'm all of these things. Okay, what I want to do then is spend the next, I don't know, 20 minutes or so unpacking each of these. Um, let's start with, you're, you're a developer. So what does that mean? Well, that means you learn a language, okay? That's the thing you probably do. You probably get good at learning several languages. You're probably now going to go and kick the tires of Go if you haven't already, because that was a really, really lovely introduction to it. I'm a big fan of Go. It's my current shiny thing. But then learning the language, learning the syntax of a language, learning the structure of a language is probably the least interesting part of it, okay? Understanding its core libraries, understanding the other libraries that are available, understanding the paradigms, the thinking model within that language is much more useful. Um, understanding what else is out there. As a programmer, you become a more effective programmer by moving, panning back from your little tunnel view and seeing what other things are going on out there. There's some really interesting uh, either, depending on your point of view, diversification, evolution, or ridiculous fragmentation going on in the .NET space right now. Okay, so that's, that, that's an unusual thing, and we're going to see that unfold. Um, Windows has discovered it's way behind the curve in terms of things like containerization. And so Microsoft just dumped tens of millions of dollars on Docker Inc. to say help, right, or let's work together or something. So you learn the tool chain as well. It's not enough to be able to write software, build software, anything. You need to be able to move that software along and give it to people. And also, it's not enough as a programmer. We haven't got to the interesting stuff yet. It's not enough as a programmer to be in your silo, to be in your bubble, in your company, in your team, building things. Okay? You need to be engaging with the community and either participating in, receiving from uh, community events, um, uh, user groups, communities of practice, all that kind of stuff, is really, really useful. So that's you as a developer. But hey, you're leading a team. Ooh. Right, how, how many people here are leading a team? Okay. Quite lots of you. How many of you are going to be leading a team so you came here to find out what it was all about? <laughs> how many of you are the cause of leading in other people? Right. Okay. So leading a team, that means you need to start understanding how work works. And I use process in a deliberately vague sense. I think of process as a system of work, okay? Understanding the system of work is really important because that means you can start to reason about that system of work. Understanding the roles within that team um, is really important because you understand what strengths, what weaknesses, what you can lean on, what you can't lean on. There's a received wisdom that forming and storming a team takes many, many months. I call shenanigans, okay? That's true unless the people who are coming together to form a team already share common values, common shared understanding of things, 
okay? And if they come together to form, uh, to, for a specific goal, for a specific purpose, then they can gel surprisingly quickly. There's any number of American movies that have the basic plot arc of bad guy comes in to dig up the town, ragtag of very, very misfit people all get together, you know, grumpy old lady, middle class, middle aged couple, uh, rebel kid, all that get together, save the town, and go, wow, we all learnt about ourselves. Wasn't that amazing, right? Is every movie ever. So people can get together and do stuff. Uh, I worked at ThoughtWorks for many years, or nine years. And we would often, you'd be thrown into a new team. And there was something about, so you get that new team together. And I knew, because that's, uh, you know, Becky's an amazing tester, right? I don't need to know Becky's an amazing tester. I need to know Becky's at ThoughtWorks as a tester. And so that means I can make assumptions about her. I know Pat's at, at ThoughtWorks as a developer, and I can make assumptions. So I can lean on people in the team. So don't be afraid to create and, and disperse teams. I think there's a lot of received wisdom and fear around that. I need to speed up. Um, collaborating with others, okay? This is the influencing part, okay? So where we start to move into the influencing part. And not just collaborating with others, collaborating with all the others. So think outside the team. What are the interfaces? Uh, Dave Thomas, Small Talk Dave Thomas, talks about organizational APIs. Right? What are the protocols within your organization? Who should you be reaching? Who should you be influencing? Who can be teaching you? Who can you be learning from? Um, and the primary thing you do as a team lead, as a lead developer, is you're attending to the team's health. Your core uh, value, no, that's not fair. Uh, I'd say your core responsibility is the sustainability of that team. Okay? And you can only be sustainable if you are healthy. Okay? So caring about how those people work. Pat mentioned empathy a number of times. Right? I cannot overemphasize this. Putting yourself inside someone else's head is a really valuable thing. So you're leading a team. But to do what? You're building a product. Okay? Building a product means that you need to start thinking in product. It's not enough to think algorithm or code or any of that stuff anymore. You're thinking, what are the business objectives here? What's the domain? Right? What are we trying to do here? What is Rent the Runway doing? Yeah? Uh, um, and getting inside of that and saying, what's the, <laughs> what's the least amount of software? And with that least amount of software, what's the simplest software I could possibly achieve those business outcomes with? Because my job isn't producing software. My job isn't leading a team to produce software. My job is solving a business objective. Okay? I have software in my back pocket as one of the tools I can use. So you study the domain. The best programmers, the best technical leads that I know, uh, um, deeply, deeply understand the domain they're operating in. To the point where I was working in one trading firm, and the traders and the developers were kind of interspersed amongst each other. You couldn't really tell who was who, because they all had masses of screens. And the developers were as likely to produce trading ideas as the traders. And the traders started learning things like Python. So they could at least sketch out ideas for things, and then the developers could pick them up. So that blurring the edges is really valuable. You need to start creating relationships with stakeholders, right? So who cares about this product? Who is this product going to impact? And all the stakeholders. I was having a conversation last night with someone who works in a bank, a very big bank, and one of the things that he's focusing on as an organizational coach is he's trying to change the perception of the downstream policeman. So security, compliance, regulatory, legal, all of these sort of guys, that generally their job is to say, none shall pass, right? No one wants to be that person, and no one wants to engage that person. So instead, you flip the whole thing around, so that person becomes a consultant into your process. I'm pretty good at software. I'm rubbish at compliance. Teach me compliance, right? What, I'm building this thing. What should I be thinking about? And I did this with some security guys once, and their eyes just went wide. They're like, no one ever talks to us. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know about security? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I want, at least I want to know that I'm not going to put the organization at risk when I put my, my, my bit of my, yeah, code out. You know, like the, 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 the likelihood of me introducing an attack vector asymptotically approaches one as I type. <laughs> um, and, but you're contributing back to the product now. There's a feedback loop. Okay? We need to get past the mentality of order takers. A great lead developer isn't, get, tell me what you want, and I shall build you the perfect pizza. It's like, pizza, you say? Pretty high in carbs. 
What's, these, what's the thing we're trying to do here? Well, actually, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm hungry. Well, let's look at all the other ways we could address you being hungry. Okay, and it becomes more of a consultative relationship. So all the stakeholders, the people downstream who will be called out. How am I doing for time? Oh, we'll be fine. Uh, um, <laughs> apparently, time is magic in here, and it keeps getting shorter, so it's all good. Uh, um, so uh, uh, a question I ask is that you've uh, some fairly, I imagine, experienced delivery folks here. What's the difference between a warning log message and an error log message? What's your criteria for whether you should log a warning or an error? Anyone? Hand at the back. Error, you need to do something. Whether you need to do something. OK, yeah. Whether you need to do something or whether someone else needs to do something. We're getting warm. depending on the environment, development and production. Here's my criteria. It's an error if you wouldn't mind being woken up at four in the morning when that message pops up. Because here's the thing, it won't be you. It'll be an operations, it'll be a support person who has a kid. And that support person just got to bed an hour ago because of that kid, and your stupid warning message just got them on call at four in the morning, and it said, error, everything's okay. <laughs> right? And you just did that. That's on you. Okay? But this is what I mean about thinking broader, because it won't be you typing. You know, to Camille's point, you're now a multiplier. You're a cause of that in other people. This is the sort of mindset you want to be getting into those people, because now suddenly everyone's a little bit more empathetic and a little bit more caring, and you start building systems that are a joy to support and to maintain. So, you're on a platform. So this is now the, the, the broader technology story. So this is where you start the impact and influence. I love that phrase. That's my new favorite phrase. So this is where you start moving beyond impact towards influence. Okay? If you have an organization-wide platform, I deal with a lot of banks, telecoms, insurance, kind of big companies. And one of the things they want to do is they want to build out platforms, often for reasonable, you know, for quite sensible reasons. Sometimes because there's someone's got a massive ego and likes the word platform. Um, <laughs> But so now, if you're going to be on a platform, you need to understand the path to production. How many of you are thinking automation at this point? And you're thinking build and deployment. Right. That's not the path to production. The path to production is the myriad stakeholders who are going to have an opinion as it goes towards that thing. The technology part of that is probably the least interesting thing. Right, may well be the least interesting thing. As a lead developer, you are thinking, how do I get this thing into production? How do I minimize that lead time from I'd like a thing to thank you? Okay, we're minimizing the lead time to thank you. So I want this thing, oh, hey, we're ready. Oh, except it's going to take four months now from we're ready to you can have it. Yeah, because meetings, right? <laughs> Luckily, we have a, a senior architect, whatever it was, from, from GDS, so he can go to all those. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> um, but you're caring about runtime concerns, OK? You are eating your own dog food. One of the most useful things I learned, and I've done this many times now, is I will rotate all of the developers through the support role. I'll rotate all the developers through um, the, the on-call, OK? All the developers will, will, will do operational work. It makes them a safer driver, OK? Uh, um, you value automation. Okay, it's important that you value automation, again, because doing manual things is boring and repetitive and error prone and it's a time suck and you want to be a multiplier, but not all the automation. Okay, I used to very much think that automate all the things. Now my rule is automate things that are boring. Okay, boring is my minimum bar for automation. Boring means I've done it enough times that I'm bored with it and it's been the same enough times that it might be a candidate for automation. So when it's boring, it might be useful to automate. Until then, don't. You're still learning about it. It's still volatile. As soon as you automate it, you lock in that ignorance at that point in history. So not all the automation. And pulling people back from the automation thing can be quite challenging as a lead developer. Hey, hey, I built this build production line. It took me weeks and weeks and weeks. What's gone through it? Nothing. Right, so our external reputation is these guys are delivering nothing. And you're calling it, this is agile, is it? OK, right. Agile. <laughs> right. And also, again, there's a feedback loop. You're contributing to the platform. So the things your team's doing is contributing to the platform. 
But now what I want us to do is pan back, okay? Because now you're in a department, and this is in exactly the same way. Pat was talking about um, understanding the flow of information in the organization into and out of the team. What's useful for the team, what's noise for the team. At a certain point, and I suspect it's going to be very soon for a lot of you guys, if not current, team means a different thing. Team means 50 or 60 people pointing in the same direction, or 100 people, or one guy I was talking to recently, 1,600 people. That's, that's a mess. That's a very, very big thing. But like, certainly, I'm working on the kind of 50, 60, 100 people scale quite often these days. And that's team now. That's team alignment. And what does that mean? That means that you need to start understanding the wider context. Right? You need to start thinking differently and making local trade-offs. So the groups of people who are tackling specific work items, you need a different word for that, because right? that's the team. Yeah? So Spotify, for instance, calls that thing a squad. I've heard it called a gang or a crew or a whatever it is. It's a group of people that come together for a specific reason, which is kill that piece of work, deliver that business outcome, disperse. Okay? Reform maybe the same people or different people around the next work item. So you become much more fluid within the team thing. Okay? That's hard. And it's counterintuitive because we've spent 15 years getting good at team. Right? And now we're kind of going, well, now we're good at team and I want to lean on that and I feel safe there. And it's exactly the same uh, availability bias, ironically, that we had 15 years ago when people said, I don't want any of this co-location stuff. I want to lean on my rational unified process. I want to lean on my SSADM. I want to lean on my Prince 2. This is the stuff that feels safe to me. We've now got team scale delivery that feels safe to us and we don't want to let go of that. You guys need to be multipliers. You need to be thinking that's the team. Okay? When you're at a sort of Camille level, as a CTO, the organization is the team. What are the organization, what are the local trade-offs I need to make such that the organization is effective? You need to share your knowledge across teams. It's amazing the little things that happen in a team that would be useful elsewhere that no one bothers, or that you don't bother to share because it, it was really trivial for you, it was really obvious to you. It may be really obvious to you, it may be really useful elsewhere. Okay? Um, so make that just a side effect of how you do work. Because if it has to be a thing you do deliberately, it becomes a zero-sum game and everyone's busy. Right? Make it a natural side effect of doing work. So uh, internal communities of practice, internal blogs, uh, news groups, uh, chat centers, any, any way of just sharing, radiating information is a great way. And make that stuff searchable. Make it easy for me to stumble across things. And this is important, all the knowledge. I was a contractor back in the late 90s, and I very quickly discovered there are two kinds of contractor, two kinds of successful contractor. The one kind of successful contractor hoards all the knowledge, right? They're the king DBA. I had a contractor, like a, a, a temporary worker contractor, who'd been at the same place for over five years and uh, was on his third permanent manager, right? He was doing okay. The other option is to share all the knowledge. Okay? I suspect one of those is more sustainable. I know which one I chose. And you're contributing to the department now. And this is, again, this is the beyond impact, beyond local impact towards influencing. How can I help us all face the same direction? Because if we're all facing the same direction, we're going to go a lot more effectively. And finally, you're in an organization. So that means that you project the organization's values. Okay? There's an alignment thing there. Um, Honest question, honest question to, uh, to ask yourselves, am I proud of the values of the organization where I work? Would I proudly wear a t-shirt? Would I proudly wear, well, maybe not proudly wear a t-shirt, would I proudly wear my company's logo on something, right? Everyone I speak to, and I'll name check some people, GDS, right, Government Digital Services, everyone there is insanely proud of what they've achieved, and they should be, right? And everyone I speak to at, uh, Spotify, I've got some buddies at Spotify. They're really proud of what they're building as an organization. Okay, there's a pride in that because they share the values and they project the values. So that's the thing that you start to do. And you care about the organization's reputation. There's a, there's a symbiosis, right? What they do reflects on you. What you do reflects on them. The more prominent, visible, you know, that thing that you're going to become in the organizations you're working in, the more true that's going to be. Uh, Pat Qua. Uh, is a really, really good programmer. That's how I remember Pat Quarle. No, he's actually he's an author, he's a presenter, he's a, a very public face of ThoughtWorks, and so there's a duty of care that comes with that, and he takes that very seriously. 
You share your knowledge externally now. Okay. Uh, um, all the knowledge. Yeah. It's surprising. There was, there was, was it Elon Musk with the with electric cars. He just gone and open sourced all of the patents. That, that made a few people nervous. Um, but share the knowledge. Okay, there's going to be some core IP that someone's going to tell you off about, right? Modulo that, share everything. Yeah? The amount of stuff that Netflix has open sourced. I love uh, Adrian Cockcroft's description of Netflix. Is a, uh, it's a, they've built a, um, a monitoring and alerting platform that, as a side effect, can stream video. Right? And they've open sourced almost all of it. Yeah? Go nuts, love it. And you're contributing then to the organization. Again, there's a thing that's going back there. Uh, I didn't realize this. When you're an employee of a company and you're doing talks at places like this, it's a really rich recruiting vector. You don't need to say we're hiring. Right? People want to work where James works. People want to work where Camille works because they're really interesting people and they've got stuff to say. And you're thinking, I'd like to work there. I'm going to go talk to that person. So you're all of these things. Okay? You're this multifaceted, multidimensional person. And you are going to be growing like crazy across many of those dimensions and be deliberate about what you invest that learning and that time in and what you don't. So you are beyond developer. I want to finish with a pithy quote because that seems to be the, 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 the curve today and I, and I, and I, I wanted to do this anyway. Um, there's a lovely African proverb that I want to share with you. I'm sure you've already heard. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. You are now moving into the space where far is your objective. Okay, and together is your priority. The thing you're doing is creating that consistency, that alignment, that directionality. Thank you. <laughs>